Hey, Faith family, hope you are doing well today. Welcome to worship. We are so glad that you had the opportunity to join us for worship. Uh, Lucas has an absolutely amazing message prepared for you. Andrew and his team has some great worship. So settle in and get ready for some awesome worship today. But before we get there, just a few things that we want to announce. Guys, we are already a week in to the month of June. I can't believe it. I don't understand where the time has gone. It seems like this year is flying by. But what that means is kids camp is only a couple of weeks away. So I want to encourage you, go to our website and get your kid signed up for kids camp. You are not going to want your kid to miss out on this event. Um, also, if you want to serve, if you want to get involved in helping Miss Kay and I pull off this amazing, amazing opportunity for our kids to encounter God, please reach out to Miss Kay to get signed up. You can shoot her an email, call her, get her a text, um, grab her on Sunday. We want to get you connected in order to be able to serve at this camp. It's going to be amazing. We also have an awesome Father's Day event coming up. Um, after services on Father's Day, we're going to have some inflatables and a food truck out here. I promise it's going to be awesome. It's going to be $5 for a Philly cheesesteak sandwich, a bag of chips, and a soda. So bring your dads, come to church, and enjoy an awesome sandwich after service. And guys, we just want to, again, thank you so much for your continued support. We can't do this, this ministry by ourselves. We need you to come alongside us. And so thank you for how you support us through uh, your finances, through prayer, through serving. We just thank you so much for allowing us to continue to do this amazing ministry alongside you. And so as we continue in our worship today together, let's confess our faith together aloud through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Praises are all 
sing that chorus one more time. I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Until this defeated, the king is alive. Father, that's the prayer of our heart as we worship together. Father, we, we come before your throne knowing that it is nothing but the blood and the sacrifice of your son that uh, is nothing but that uh, that has been able to wash us clean of everything that we have in our hearts uh, that is impure and broken and our sin, everything that we hold inside and, and crumble because of. Father, you take it away and you wash it clean, and we are so grateful for that. We, uh, we come before you knowing that um, this is where we can be safe. This is where we can be made whole. This is where we can be made clean. 
is at the feet of Jesus. And so we worship you, we bring ourselves to you, and we offer our lives and our hearts to you. Father, just pray over the rest of the service, uh, the words that you've laid on Pastor Lucas's heart. Just pray that they would move our hearts, that we would know you more, that we would hear you, that we would feel the nudging of your Holy Spirit uh, to, to grow deeper in knowing who you are and having a relationship with our good God. Uh, so, Father, we offer you this time. It is yours. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. On December 8, 1980, John Lennon and Yoko Ono left their apartment in the Dakota building on 72nd Street on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, New York. As they were walking to the limousine that was waiting for them, a young man asked for an autograph. And John, he was in a hurry that day, but he took the time to stop and to meet the young man and gave him his autograph before getting into a limo and proceeding to a recording studio. Almost six hours later, as Lennon and Ono returned home, the same young man was still there awaiting their return. This time, however, Mark David Chapman didn't ask for an autograph. He waited until John Lennon had walked by and he pulled out a 38 special revolver and fired five rounds, four of them hitting John Lennon in the back. And as you know, Lennon was rushed to the hospital, but he did not survive. When Chapman was arrested, he was holding in his hand the classic novel, The Catcher in the Rye. And when questioned by the police about the shooting, he claimed this. He said, the big part of me is Holden Caulfield, which was the main character in this book. And then he said, the small part of me must be the devil. As time would go on, some level of clarity would come to Chapman's motive for the shooting. He'd become a huge Beatles fan, but he was increasingly angry with John Lennon's hypocrisy. In later interviews, he would discuss how Lennon would talk and sing and advocate for this utopian state in which everybody was equal, and yet was living in a lavish uh, lifestyle in a plush high-rise apartment, had limo drivers and yachts and everything that marked the elite in America. Lennon had, after all, created a nice public image for himself. Remember the words to the song, Imagine? No possessions, I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. Yet in reality, Lennon was known by all those who worked with him as greedy and as somebody who was motivated by money and self-pleasure. Chapman also became angry over Lennon's belittling of people's belief in God especially Lennon's controversial statement that he said that he was bigger than Jesus. The question that was debated in the months that followed throughout Chapman's trial and appeals was whether he was insane or whether he was evil, whether he was mentally ill or whether he was acting on what he perceived to be righteous anger against a hypocritical superstar who with his words uh, said that American capitalism was unfair and immoral. But in reality, he soaked up every benefit that it offered him. Was Chapman crazy or was he evil? I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not really qualified to answer that question. But it does sound an awful lot like the questions that we see in the Bible about who Jesus was, especially in our text today. So with that Beatles-themed introduction, we start a brand new summer sermon series called Truth Over Trend. You see, trends and beliefs and ideas, they come and go. And everybody inside and outside of the church is influenced by them. And our calling as followers of Christ is we are called to look to God's word, to the Bible, not to culture for direction and purpose and truth and certainty in our lives. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be using scripture this summer from the weekly lectionary text. And some of you might be asking, what is a lectionary? What is it? You see, a lectionary is a table of readings from Scripture appointed to be read at public worship services. And the association of particular texts and specific days began in the 4th century by the Roman Catholic Church. The church year and the lectionary gives us as Christians the opportunity for shared experience with other churches and believers who are also using the lectionary. And it also helps us to remember that we are not only drawn into the salvation story, 
But as people of God, we are a part of the story. And this leads us to encounter and to ponder and to proclaim and show forth Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday and today and forever. The text that, from the lectionary that I have chosen for this weekend is found in Mark chapter 3. You see, in Mark chapter 3, Mark pairs together two seemingly unrelated circumstances to teach us about the reality and the danger of unbelief. And then he turns it around and reveals a tremendous gift that is given to all who believe. As we reflect on this text, we see three realities regarding belief and unbelief. The first thing that we see is the prevalence of unbelief. And this shows up in two ways in Mark's account. So let's look at verses 20 through 21 and let's notice the unbelief of Jesus' own family. Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 21 say this. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he was out of his mind. You see, right before this, Jesus healed a man's withered hand on the Sabbath. He was casting out demons and saying all sorts of things that were angering the religious leaders and teachers and the Pharisees. So much so that they were starting to make plans to kill Jesus. And Jesus, his own family, was concerned that he was out of his mind, that he was going crazy. And they had doubts about who he was. You see, this is also reinforced in John chapter 7 of his gospel. When he tells us that Jesus' own brothers did not believe in him. But we know that from later on in the Gospels and from church history that many of Jesus' relatives at one point in time did come to believe in him later on in life. One of Jesus' brothers, Jude, would go on to write one of the books in the New Testament. But at this time in Jesus' ministry, Mark tells us that they weren't believing. In fact, that they were questioning his sanity. And I think that we can look at Jesus' actions and decisions here, and we can kind of understand how he arrived at that assumption. For one example, he was the firstborn son. And during this culture at this time, there was a huge importance for the firstborn. According to Jewish tradition, Jesus would have had a very clear and defined role as the firstborn, with clear responsibilities and clear uh, benefits because of his birth order. It may have been common for a younger sibling to to leave home and to pack up and to take off and to walk away from responsibilities. But it was embarrassing for the family if the firstborn did that. Not only that, but they're likely starting to hear rumors about the controversy caused by some of the things that Jesus was saying and doing. And his family, they were trying to piece these things together in their minds so they feel the need to protect him. They know some of the things that he's been saying and doing could get him killed. And so they set out to seize him and to take him home for his own protection. So if they or if we don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then there's only so many options when it comes to how we think about Jesus. And I know that I've preached on this before and I've talked about this before, but I believe that there is a great quote from C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity that so helpfully explains people who deny the divinity of Jesus but still want to reference Jesus as a good teacher. C.S. Lewis writes this, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says that he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Jesus' own family didn't know what to make of Jesus. Those closest to him weren't sure what to think. 
For them, it seemed that the insanity defense maybe was the easiest way to deal with him. Or maybe that he was totally out of his mind. And so they arrive and they, they try to take him home for his own good and protection. But it wasn't just Jesus' family who didn't believe. Notice the unbelief of the religious leaders as well in verse 22. It says this, And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebul. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. It's likely that these religious leaders that Mark mentions were sent from Jerusalem specifically for the purpose of spying on Jesus and reporting back to the high priest. And so Mark, he inserts this account right here where the teachers accuse Jesus of being possessed by Beelzebul, who was also known as the prince of demons. His name likely has his origins in the worship of Baal. And it was believed that Baal's wicked prophets received their powers from the demons. So Jesus' family makes the assumption that he is crazy. But the religious leaders here, they go with C.S. Lewis's other option, that he was possessed by a demon. And again, I'm, I'm reading this story, and, and their reasoning, I think, has some merit to it. They assume that, that Jesus, he couldn't possibly be the Messiah that they had been hoping for. He didn't fit the mold that they had in their minds for what the Messiah would be. He didn't check all the boxes or follow the rules. So in their minds, who was Jesus? In their minds, what were the alternatives? And they came to the conclusion that demon possession was a good option for them. It's kind of like when I was in Haiti a few years ago and Nanette and, and a bunch of us were down there doing a Kids at Heart conference. And while we were teaching this conference, when it came my turn to teach, there was a guy who was sitting uh, towards the back of the room. And he got up and, and he walked out and it, it was kind of awkward and I kind of just kept talking uh, but then after I was done teaching, uh, there's a picture, uh, uh, Scotty will put it up here on the screen, but it's a picture of me here in the middle of all of these Haitians who could not believe that I could be a Christian or a pastor with tattoos. Literally one guy, and I've been called this quite a bit in Haiti, one guy called me the Blanc Diablo, which means the white devil. And we had this big argument, and I'm arguing with these guys, and, I'm, I'm, and they're, they're talking about tattoos, and you can't be a Christian with tattoos. And I finally asked one of them, I said, where in the Bible does it say that you can't have tattoos? And he could not find it anywhere in the Bible. I know that it's in Leviticus, but he couldn't find it. But we ended up having this great discussion after a heated debate where we started talking about, about God's grace and and. and it was just an incredible conversation. But you see, a lot of them could not believe that I could be a Christian. And they had made up in their minds that I was probably demon-possessed or insane. But after this conversation, it ended up with a big hug and, and we had a great week together. You see, we see two sides in our text so far. Insanity or demon possession. Two sides from the same coin of unbelief. But notice here that Jesus is quick to refute the religious teacher's argument. His response is pretty logical, I think. Let's look starting at verse 23 here. It says this. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. You see, Jesus actually gives them an alternative way to view what he was doing. He says that he was not possessed by Beelzebul, but goes on to say in verse 26, he says this, And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first, first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Think about the beauty of this picture. Jesus is obviously talking about Satan here, the prince of darkness, the one who deceived humanity and took them for his own possession. And Jesus says that he came into the world to tie up the strong man and to plunder his house. And that's exactly what Jesus would do. He came not doing the works of evil, but in order to defeat evil and to conquer sin and death and Satan. Next, I want us to take a look at the dangers of unbelief. 
Jesus goes on in verses 28 through 32 confronting unbelief head on. And he issues an important warning for all of us. Look here, starting in verse 28. Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Whoa. Gosh, there are quite a few passages in the Bible that have caused so much confusion and wrestling than Jesus' words right here in these verses. It kind of reminds me of that, that, that show, uh, Family Matters, growing up, where Steve Urkel would always go around saying, did I do that? Right? Like, we read this, and, and I think we often ask that question, have I committed the unforgivable sin? Did I do that? That's why I believe that context is so critical when reading the Bible. These words are so difficult to process if we just rip them right out of the context in the Gospels. But Mark clearly intends for these verses to be read and understood in the middle of this discussion over unbelief. But what we so often do is we so often read these verses and we focus on one verse instead of all the other verses that are filled with God's promises of forgiveness to us. You see, as Jesus is confronting the unbelief of the scribes, he's talking about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But what does that even mean? Think about this. They are calling the Holy Spirit's work evil. They are calling light darkness. They are watching the very work of God in front of their eyes and labeling it as the work of demons. And they are conspiring to kill Jesus because he has the audacity to heal a man's withered hand on the Sabbath. And they're angered over the fact that Jesus goes and heals lepers and restores uh, their lives. They're angry that Jesus is going around and forgiving people's sins apart from the law. So what is the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit? It's the conscious and deliberate rejection and denial of God's saving work and purpose. This is not a sin that someone just stumbles into. This is a defiant resistance to the Holy Spirit. In going so far as to label the work that God is doing as evil. But notice Jesus' emphasis here on the abundance of God's forgiveness. We have to understand that these verses in the context of what Jesus is saying about forgiveness. Because forgiveness is abundant. All their sins, Jesus says, every slander can be forgiven. And this is an important emphasis when we think about these confusing words. We have to be careful that we don't apply Jesus' words here about blaspheming the Holy Spirit outside of the context in which Jesus said them. You see, Jesus is calling out the hard hearts of the religious leaders who see the very hand of God and the work of the Holy Spirit among them, who in fact see the Son of God himself walking among them, healing people and calling him evil. Please do not confuse this with doubt. Do not confuse what Jesus is saying here with the simple doubt that all of us feel at times. Don't confuse what Jesus is saying with our struggle with sin. This is the clear and intentional mislabeling of the good work of God as something evil. This is the danger of unbelief. Today, we might just doubt God's goodness. Today, we might just just doubt that God will provide for us. Today, we might just doubt that God has our best in mind. We might doubt today that God loves us, that God loves us more than we could love ourselves. Or maybe today we're enjoying a particular sin so much so that we don't want to give it up. The danger is not that our sin today won't be forgiven. The danger is that eventually we will find our hearts so hardened, so calloused by our sin and doubt that we become like the religious leaders here in this text, full of knowledge about God but blaspheming the very work and the spirit of God with our lips and calling his work evil. Jesus' words are not intended to cause us to live in fear that we have unknowingly committed the sin that will damn us to hell. This is a call to repentance, a call to heed the warning about unbelief and to by the power of the Holy Spirit to turn to the cross and to Christ, and to believe in the forgiveness of our sins, not to live in fear, not to walk around wondering, did I do that? 
We see the prevalence of unbelief, the danger of unbelief in this text. And finally, we see the relational result of faith in Jesus Christ. We see this in verses 31 through 32. And we see here that that Jesus, his family, is now back on the scene. Starting in verse 31, it says this. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mothers and brothers are outside looking for you. Jesus' mother and his brothers came, and they called for him. Like I said earlier, they're worried that he was going to get himself killed. They're worried that he was crazy. And so they're wanting to take him back to Nazareth with them. You see, notice Jesus' reaction here. He asked a rhetorical question. Look, starting at verse 33, it says this. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. In many ways, this is a shocking turn of events. Jesus' words could be read as disrespectful in a disrespectful tone. But think about this. Think about how you would react if you hear these words, if you were in Jesus' family. And yet we can't miss what Jesus is doing here. He's not downplaying or despising family relationships or connections. He is elevating a reality of our adoption into the family of God by faith. He is lifting up that by faith we are a part of God's family. And those ties bind us tightly to him. You see, we don't feel the full weight of this as American Christians oftentimes because we've never really been been faced with persecution. By and large, we've never been tremendously alienated because of our faith. But all those who follow Jesus, uh, we know the outcome of his disciples. All of them ended up being killed or martyred or abandoned because because of their faith. Those who weren't martyred or or were alienated and kicked out of their families. They were disowned. They were marginalized. They had to walk away from everything they had known. The cost of following Jesus was high. So think about these words of Jesus. You see, he gives a gift to all Christians here. A promise that by faith alone, we have a family. By faith in Jesus Christ, we belong We have a family that cares for its own, or it's supposed to care for its own. We have a family that loves and welcomes. You see, Jesus basically says that God desires that the relational ties of your family of faith be every bit as tight, if not tighter than the ties to your biological family. Jesus isn't downplaying your biological family. He's lifting up. He's exalting the role of Christ's church, the family of faith. Jesus is simply making it clear that by faith in him, we are all brought into a new kingdom. We are all given a new family. And this is a beautiful gift and a promise to all of us. It's a gift and a promise that should cause all of us to consider how we view our family of faith here. How we view one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so my question for us is, do we view the church as a service provider? Think about that. Do we view the church as a social club? Or do we view the people around us in our church, sitting around us today, as my family? Do we view the church as a place that proclaims the true gospel, the truth of God's word, and the forgiveness of sins to all who walk through the doors of our church or who watch us online? Think about the difference. Think about the people around you as really your mothers and father and brothers and sisters in Christ. Because when we think that way, it changes our commitment to one another. And it also changes the way that we show grace and love and mercy to each other. It changes everything. I think far too often we view the church as an organization and not as a family. And I love this picture of a family because a family says, I know your deepest failings and I love you anyways. A family says, I know your scars. I know your mistakes. I know your personality flaws. I know what you look like without makeup on. I know what your feet smell like after a long day, but I love you. I'm not going anywhere. 
Mark packs these stories together for a purpose. He wants us to believe. So I ask all of us today, do we believe, not just intellectually affirm that this is historical truth, but do we believe the words and the promises of Jesus? Who do you believe Jesus is? Is he crazy? Is he a few sandwiches short of a picnic? Is he evil? Is he a good moral teacher? Or is he the high king of heaven who died for your sins and claimed you as his own? You see, once we have that question settled, what Jesus makes clear for us is that we are given this incredible promise, that we are not on our own. We will never be on our own, that we have a family, that we are loved and accepted. But I'm here to tell you that Satan will immediately attack this promise, that every single day this promise will be attacked with lies and questions from Satan, like, did God really mean that? Does God really love you? Did God really say that? And so my prayer today is that you would find faith in the truth of this promise, which will always drown out that voice. Because when Christ possesses us by faith, we only hear one thing in our ears, and that is you are my child with whom I am well pleased. By God's grace, may Faith Community Lutheran Church be a place where people can wrestle with this question of who Jesus is and may all find the truth about who Jesus is. And may all who enter our doors or who watch online find themselves in the open arms of a loving family of faith and know that the promise of the forgiveness of sins is for them. Let us pray. God, I thank you so much for the truth of of your word. God, I thank you for the promises that we find in these words. The promise that, that our sins are forgiven. God, I pray if anybody here today is being attacked with the, the lie of, of, did you really mean these things? That they would hear right now in their ears that you are my child with whom I am well pleased. God, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you for your forgiveness for us. And that we can find forgiveness by faith alone, that we are your children. God, may we rest in that today, in that promise. God, I pray that Faith Community will continue to to be a church where all who walk through our doors would know your love for them. And that they would find faith in these promises. And may we continue to be a church that stands on the truth of your word. Not, Not on trends or culture or anything else, but we will continue to stand true on your word for us. As we leave here today, may we continue to, to, to live in your grace and to walk in your love. Pray these things in your name. Amen.
swing wide All in heavens Let the praise go up As the walls come down All creation Everything with breath Repeat the sound All the children Clean hands Pure hearts Good grace Good God His name is Jesus Well, as Lucas talked about this morning, we are all family, and God calls us into this community and family, and one of the gifts he gives us is prayer. And so now we want to spend some time praying for each other, praying for our brothers and sisters across the world, and really um, for anything that's on your heart so that the Holy Spirit prompts you to. So let's spend some time in prayer. God, we are thankful this morning that we are yours, and the voice that we hear, the voice we can listen for, is that voice of you telling us and calling us your children, uh, and allowing us and inviting us to be a part of your ministry and who you are and what you're doing. And so, as part of that, we want to offer back to you all that you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and all of our things. We pray that you would use it to further your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, your word teaches us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and all that is unright within us. So this morning as we come before you, we confess our sins to you from the silence of our hearts. Thank you, God, that this morning, too, through Lucas's sermon, we are reminded of the forgiveness that you offer us and that we do stand before you as your children, that we are redeemed and that we are forgiven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we also pray for all those that are sick and suffering, for those that are grieving, those that are heavy hearted, especially those that we name before you now. We pray that you would lay your holy hand on them and bring them healing, help them to know your comfort, surround them with your love and give them your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as in your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we gather, we remember that it is in the night in which he was betrayed that our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And then after supper, he took the cup and he again gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this also to remember me. So we prepare our hearts and our minds for communion this morning. Let's pray using the words of the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear cause I am a child Thank you for joining us today. It's been good to worship with you. We hope and pray that you have been encouraged this morning, that you have heard God's word, that you have uh, been fed and filled, and that you are ready this week to go out and serve. And so as you go today, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.